The following is a conversation with Dmitry Korkin. He's a professor of bioinformatics and computational biology at WPI, Worcester Polytechnic Institute, where he specializes in bioinformatics of complex diseases, computational genomics, systems biology, and biomedical data analytics. I came across Dmitry's work when in February, his group used the viral genome of the COVID-19 to reconstruct the 3D structure of its major viral proteins and their interaction with the human proteins. In effect, creating a structural genomics map of the coronavirus and making this data open and available to researchers everywhere. We talked about the biology of COVID-19, SARS, and viruses in general, and how computational methods can help us understand their structure and function in order to develop antiviral drugs and vaccines. This conversation was recorded recently in the time of the coronavirus pandemic. For everyone feeling the medical, psychological, and financial burden of this crisis, I'm sending love your way. Stay strong. We're in this together. We'll beat this thing. This is the Artificial Intelligence Podcast. If you enjoy it, subscribe on YouTube, review it with five stars on Apple Podcasts, support it on Patreon, or simply connect with me on Twitter at Lex Friedman, spelled F-R-I-D-M-A-N. This show is presented by Cash App, the number one finance app in the App Store. When you get it, use code Lex Podcast. Cash App lets you send money to friends, buy Bitcoin, and invest in the stock market with as little as $1. Since Cash App allows you to buy Bitcoin, let me mention that cryptocurrency in the context of the history of money is fascinating. I recommend Ascent of Money as a great book on this history. Debits and credits on ledgers started around 30,000 years ago. The US dollar created over 200 years ago. And Bitcoin, the first decentralized cryptocurrency released just over 10 years ago. So given that history, cryptocurrency is still very much in its early days of development, but is still aiming to, and just might, redefine the nature of money. So again, if you get Cash App from the App Store, Google Play, and use the code LEXPODCAST, you get $10, and Cash App will also donate $10 to FIRST, an organization that is helping to advance robotics and STEM education for young people around the world. And now, here's my conversation with Dmitry Korkin. Do you find viruses terrifying or fascinating? When I think about viruses, I think about them, I mean, I imagine them as those villains that do their work so perfectly well. That's, that is impossible not to be fascinated with them. So what do you imagine when you think about a virus? Do you imagine the individual, sort of these 100 nanometer particle things? Or do you imagine the whole pandemic, like society level, the, when you say the efficiency at which they do their work, do you think of viruses as the millions that and, and that occupy a human body or a living organism, society level, like spreading as a pandemic, or do you think of the individual little guy? Yes, this is. I think this is a unique, a unique concept that allows you to move from micro scale to the macro scale, right? So the the virus itself. I mean, it's it's not a living organism. It's a machine. To me, it's a machine, but it is perfected to the way that it essentially has a limited number of functions it needs to do, necessary functions. And it essentially has enough information just to do those functions, as well as the ability to modify itself. So, you know, it's, it's a machine, it's an intelligent machine. So yeah, look, maybe on that point, you're in danger of reducing the power of this thing by calling it a machine, right? Um, but you now mentioned that it's also possibly intelligent. It seems that there's these elements of brilliance that a virus has, of intelligence, of maximizing so many things about its behavior and to ensure its survival and its and its success. So do you see it as intelligent? So, you know, I think the, it's a different, I understand it differently than, you know, I think about 
you know intelligence of a humankind or intelligence of of the of the you know of the artificial intelligence uh, mechanisms uh i think the intelligence of a virus is in its simplicity <laughs> the ability to do so much with so little material and information um but also i think it's it's interesting it keeps me thinking uh, you know it keeps me um wondering whether or not it's also the the an example of uh the basic swarm intelligence where you know, essentially uh the viruses act as the whole and they're extremely efficient in that so what do you attribute the incredible simplicity and the efficiency to is it the evolutionary process so maybe another way to ask that if you look at the next 100 years are you more worried about the natural pandemics or the engineered pandemics so how hard is it to build a virus yes it's it's a very very interesting question because obviously there is a lot of conversations about the you know whether we are capable of engineering a you know an even worse virus i personally expect and am con mostly concerned with the naturally occurring viruses simply because we keep seeing that we keep seeing new strains of influenza emerging some of them becoming pandemic we keep seeing new strains of coronaviruses emerging um, this is a natural process and I, I think this is why it's so powerful you know if you ask me you know did i've i've read uh, papers about scientists trying to study the capacity of the modern you know uh biotechnology to alter the viruses but i hope that that you know it in it won't be our main concern in the near future what do you mean by hope <laughs> well you know if you look back and look at the history of the of the most dangerous viruses right so the the first thing that comes into mind is a, a smallpox so right now there is perhaps a handful of places where this you know the the, the strains of this virus are stored right so this is essentially the effort of the whole society to limit the access to those uh viruses and you mean in the lab in the controlled environment in order to correct. study and then smallpox is one of the viruses for which um, sh should be stated there's a vaccine is developed yes yes and that's you know it's uh, until 70s it i mean in my opinion it was perhaps the most dangerous thing that was there is that a very different virus than um than the influenza and the coronaviruses it is it is different in several aspects biologically it's a you know, so-called uh double-stranded dna virus uh but also in the way that it is much more um contagious so um the r not for so this is this is the uh what's r not r not is essentially an average number as person infected by the virus can spread to other people so then the average number of uh, people that he or she can uh you know spread it to and you know the there is still some uh you know uh, discussion about the estimates uh of the current 
uh, virus, uh, you know, the estimations vary between, you know, 1.5 and 3. Um, in case of smallpox, it was uh, 5 to 7. And we're talking about the exponential growth, right? Yeah. So, so that's that's a very big difference. Um, it's not the most contagious one. Measles, for example, it's I think fifteen and up. So, so it's it's you know, but it's definitely definitely uh, more contagious that uh, that the seasonal flu than the current coronavirus or SARS for that matter. So what makes a uh, what makes a virus more contagious? Well, like I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of variables that come into play, but is it is it that whole discussion of aerosol and like the size of droplets if it, if it's airborne or is there some other stuff that's more biology centered? I mean, there are a lot of components and and uh, there are biological components that there are also you know social components. Um, the ability of the virus to, um, you know, so the the ways in which the virus is spread is definitely one. Um, the ability to virus to stay on the surfaces, to survive. The ability of the virus to replicate fast. So, so you know. Well, once it's in the cell or whatever. They... Once it's in, inside the host. And interestingly enough, something that, I think we didn't pay that much attention to is the uh, incubation period, the where you know hosts are symptomatic. And now it turns out that another thing that we one really needs to take into account uh, the percentage of the symptomatic population, because those people still shed this virus and still are you know they still are contagious. I saw there's an, the Iceland study, which I think is probably the most impressive size-wise, shows 50% asymptomatic for this virus. I also recently learned the, the swine flu is uh, like the, just the number of people who got infected was in the billions. It was some crazy number. It was like, it was like, uh, like twenty percent of the pop, thirty percent of the population, something crazy like that. So the lucky thing there is the fatality rate is low, but the fact that a virus can just take over an entire population so quickly, yes, it's terrifying. I think. I mean, this is you know, <laughs> that's perhaps my favorite example of a butterfly effect, <laughs> because it's really. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> even tinier than, than a butterfly. And look at you know, and with you know, if you think about it, right? So it it used to be in in those bat species, and perhaps because of you know a couple of small changes in in the in the viral genome, it first had you know uh, become capable of jumping from bats to human, and then it became capable of jumping from human to human. Right, so this is this is. I mean, it's not even the size of a virus. It's the size of several, you know, uh, several atoms or says, you know, a few atoms, and over sudden this change has such a major impact. So is that a mutation like on a single virus? Is that like so? If we talk about those the the flap of a butterfly wing, like what's the first flap? Well, I think this is the, the the mutations that make that made this virus capable of jumping from bat species to human. And of course, there's you know the scientists are still trying to find. I mean, they're still even trying to find the the who was the first infected, right? The patient zero, the first human, yeah. the first human infected, right? Uh, I mean, the fact that there are coronaviruses different strains of coronaviruses in various bad species. I mean, we know that. So so we, you know, uh, virologists observe them, they study them, they look at their you know, genomic sequences. They are trying, of course, to understand what make these viruses to jump 
from uh, from bats to human. There was, you know, similar to that, and in, you know, in, in influenza, there was, I think, a few years ago, there was uh, this, um, you know, interesting story where uh, several groups of scientists studying uh, influenza virus essentially. Uh, you know, made experiments to show that this virus can jump from one species to another, you know, by changing, I think, just a couple of residues. And, and, and of course, it was very controversial. I think uh, there was a, a moratorium on this study for a while, but then the f study was released, it was published, so Those that things. why was there a moratorium? Is because it shows through engineering it, through modifying it, you can make a jump. Yes. Yes. I I personally think it is important to study this. I mean, we, we should be informed. We should try to understand as much as possible in order to prevent it. But so then the engineering aspect there is. Can't you then just start searching because there's so many strands of viruses out there. Can't you just search for the ones in bats that are the deadliest from the vir virologist perspective and then just try to engineer, try to see how to, but see that's a, th there's a nice aspect to it. Uh, th the really nice thing about engineering viruses, it's, it has the same problem as nuclear weapons is it's hard for it, it to not to lead to mutual self-destruction. So you can't control a virus. It can't be used as a weapon, right? Yeah, that, that's why I, you know, in the beginning I said, you know, I, I'm hopeful because there the definitely, the definitely uh, regulations to be needed to be introduced. And I mean, as the scientific society is, we are in charge of, you know, making the right, actions making the right decisions but i think we we will benefit tremendously by understanding the mechanisms uh, by which the virus can jump by which the virus can become more you know more, more uh, dangerous to humans because all these answers would you know, eventually lead to, to designing better vaccines, hopefully universal vaccines, right? And that would be a, a triumph of the, of, you know, of science. So what's the universal vaccine? So is that something that, well, how you, universal is universal? Well, I mean, you know, so. What's the dream, I guess? Cause you kind of mentioned the dream of this. Whole. I would be extremely happy if, you know, we designed the vaccine that is able, I mean, I'll give you an example, right? So, so every year we do a seasonal flu shot. The reason we do it is because, you know, we are in the arms race, you know, our vaccines are in the arms race with, with constantly changing virus, right? Uh, now, if the next pandemic, influenza pandemic will, a cure, most likely this vaccine would not save us, right? Although it's, it's, you know, it's the same virus, might be different strain. Um, so if we're able to essentially design a vaccine against, you know, influenza A virus, no matter what's the strain, no matter what, which species uh, did it jump from, that would be, I think, that would be a huge, huge progress and advancement. So you mentioned uh, smallpox until the 70s might have been something that you would be worried the most about. What about these days? Well, we're sitting here in the middle of a COVID-19 pandemic, but these days, nevertheless, what is your biggest worry virus-wise? What are you keeping your eye out on? It looks like, uh, and you know, based on the uh, past several years of the of the new viruses emerging, I think we're still uh, dealing with different types of influenza. I mean, so so the 
H7 and 9 uh, avian uh, flu that was uh, that emerged I think a couple of years ago in China I think the 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 uh, mortality rate was incredible I mean it was you know I think above 30 percent you know so this is this is huge I mean luckily for us this strain was not pandemic all right so it was jumping from birds to human but I don't think it 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 was actually transmittable between the humans and you know this is actually a very interesting question uh, which uh, scientists try to um, understand right so the balance the delicate balance between the virus being very contagious right so um, uh, efficient in spreading and virus to be uh, very pathogenic you know causing you know uh, harms you know and and deaths to to their host so it looks like that the more pathogenic the virus is the less contagious it is is that a property of biology or what is it what is the, i i don't have an answer to that and I, I i think this is this is still an open question but you know if you look at uh, you know with the coronavirus for example if you look at you know the the deadlier relative mers MERS was never a, a pandemic virus. Right. But the, you know, the, again, the, the mortality rate from MERS is far above, you know, I think 20 or 30%, so. So whatever is making this all happen doesn't want us dead because it's balancing out <laughs> nicely. I mean, uh, like, how do you explain that we're not dead yet? Like, because there's so many viruses and they're so good at what they do. Why do they keep us alive? I mean, we As, we also have, you know, a lot of protection, right? So, the so with system, the, the right? immune system, and so, uh, I mean, we we do have, you know, ways to to fight against those viruses, and I think with the I. Th now we're much better equipped, right? So with the discoveries of vaccines, and you know, there are vaccines against the the viruses that maybe two hundred years ago would wipe us out completely. But because of these vaccines, we are actually we are capable of eradicating pretty much fully, as is the case with smallpox. So. If we could, can we go to the basics a little bit of uh, the biology of the virus? How does a virus infect the body? So I think there are some key steps that the virus needs to perform. And of course, the first one, the viral particle needs to get attached to the host cell. In the case of coronavirus, there is a lot of evidence that uh, it actually interacts in the same way um, of the uh, as the SARS coronavirus. So it uh, gets attached to AC2 human receptor. And so there is, I mean, as we speak, there is a growing number of papers suggesting it. Um, moreover, uh, most recent, I think most recent results suggest that uh, this virus attaches more efficiently to this human receptor than SARS. So just to sort of back off, uh, so there's a family of viruses, the coronaviruses, and SARS, whatever the heck, forgot, this is whatever that stands for. Uh, so SARS actually uh, stands for the disease that you get, is the syndrome of acute respiratory. respiratory uh, syndrome. Yeah. So SARS is the first strand and then there's MERS, MERS is, is and there is family. So, and there is yes, but uh, people scientists actually know more than three strains. I mean, so there is uh, the MHV uh, strain, uh, which is considered to be a canonical um, model disease model um, in mice, and so there is a lot of work done on on this virus oh, because it, it's. But it hasn't jumped to humans yet? No, no. Oh, it's, interesting. Yes. That's fascinating. 
Uh, so, uh, and then you mentioned AC2. So the when you say attach, proteins are involved yes. on both sides. Yes. So so we have you know so we have this infamous spike protein on the surface of uh, the virion particle, and it does look like a spike. And I mean that's essentially because of this protein. You know we call the coronavirus coronavirus. So so that what makes corona on top of the uh, surface. Um, so, so this vi uh, this uh, protein, it actually, it acts, uh, so it doesn't act alone, it actually, it makes a, a three copies and it, it, it makes so-called trimer. So this trimer is essentially a functional unit, a single functional unit that in starts interacting um, with the AC2 um, receptor. So this is again another protein that now sits on the surface of a human cell, or a host cell, I would say, um, and that's essentially in that way the virus anchors itself to the host cell because then it needs to actually it needs to get inside. You know, it fuses its uh, membrane with the host membrane. It releases the uh, the key components. It releases its um, you know uh, RNA, and then essentially hijacks the um, the machinery of the cell because uh, none of the viruses that we know of have ribosome, the the machinery that allows us to print out proteins. So in order to print out proteins that are necessary for functioning of this virus, it actually needs to hijack the host ribosomes. So a virus is an RNA wrapped in a bunch of proteins, one of which is this functional mechanism of a spike protein that does the attachment in the... So yeah, so, so, you know, so if you look at this virus, so there are you know, several basic components, right? So we start with the spike protein, this is not the only surface protein, the, the protein that lives on the surface of the viral particle. So there is also uh, perhaps the uh, uh, the protein with the highest number of copies is the membrane protein. So it's essentially, it forms the capsi uh, sorry, the envelope of the protein uh, of the viral uh, particle. And uh, essentially, you know, uh, helps to maintain a certain curvature, helps to make a certain curvature. Then there is a, uh, another protein uh, called uh, envelope protein or E-protein, and it, uh, it actually occurs in, in far less quantities. And still there is uh, an ongoing research what exactly does this protein do. So these are sort of the, the three major surface proteins that you know, make the uh, the viral envelope, and when we go inside, then we have uh, another structural protein called nuclear protein, and the the purpose of this protein is to protect the viral RNA. So it actually binds to the viral RNA, creates a capsid, and so the rest of the virus uh, viral information is inside of this you know RNA, and you know, if you compare the amount of the genes or, you know, proteins that are made of these genes, it's much, you know, it's significantly higher than uh, of influenza virus, for example. Influenza virus has, I think, around eight or nine uh, proteins, where this one uh, has at least 29. Wow. That has to do with the length of the RNA strand. I mean, what? Uh... So I mean, so it 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 affects the length of the RNA strand, right? So 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 because you essentially need to have sort of the minimum amount of information to encode those genes. How many proteins did you say? Sorry, again. Twenty nine. Twenty nine so, so, proteins. So, yes. So so this is this is you know uh, something definitely uh, interesting because you know believe it or not uh, we've been studying. Uh, you know, coronaviruses for over two decades, we've yet to uncover all functionalities of its proteins. Could we maybe take a small tangent and can you um, 
Can you say how one would try to figure out what a function of a particular protein is? Hmm. So you, you've mentioned people are still trying to figure out what the function of the envelope protein might be, or what's the process? So this is where um, the research that computational scientists do might be of help because, you know, in the past several decades, we actually have collected a pretty decent amount of knowledge about different proteins uh, in different viruses. So what we can actually try to do, and this is sort of, uh, could be sort of the, our first lead to a possible function, is to see whether those, you know, say we, we have this uh, genome of the coronavirus, of the, of the novel coronavirus, and we identify the potential proteins. Then in order to infer the function, what we can do, we can actually see whether those uh, proteins are similar to those ones that we already know, okay? In such a way, we can, you know, for example, clearly identify, uh, you know, some critical components that RNA polymerase or different types of proteases, these are the proteins that essentially um, clip the protein sequences. Um, and so this works in many cases. However, in some cases you have truly novel proteins. And this is a, an, an, a much more difficult task. Now, uh, as a, a small pause, when you say similar, like what if some parts are different and some parts are similar? Like, how do you uh, disentangle that? You know, it's it's a big question. Of course, you know, uh, what bioinformatics does, uh, it does predictions, right? So those predictions, are, they have to be validated by experiments. Functional or structural predictions? Uh, both. I mean, we, we do structural predictions, we do functional predictions, we do uh, interactions predictions. Oh, so this is interesting. So you just generate a lot of predictions, like reasonable predictions based on structure and function, interaction, like you said. And then here you go. That's the power of bioinformatics is data grounded, good predictions of what should happen. So we, you know, in a way uh, I see it, we're helping experimental scientists to streamline the discovery process. Yeah. And the experimental scientist, is that what a virologist is? So yeah, vi virology is one of the experimental uh, sciences that you know focus on viruses. Uh, they often work with other experimental scientists. For example, the uh, molecular imaging uh, scientists, right? So the 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 viruses often can be viewed and reconstructed through uh, electron microscopy techniques. So, but these are you know specialists that are not necessarily vi virologists. They work with small, uh, small uh, particles, small vi whether it's viruses or it's a uh, an organelle of a you know of, of a human cell, whether it's a you know complex molecular machinery. So the techniques that are used are very similar in in sort of in its in their essence, and so yeah, so so. It, Typically, I mean, and, and we see it now, the research on, you know, that is emerging and that, that is needed often involves the collaborations between virologists, you know, exp uh, biochemists, uh, you know, uh, uh, people from uh, pharma, uh, uh, pharmaceutical sciences, computational sciences. So uh, we have to work you know, together. So from my perspective, just to step back, sometimes I look at this stuff, just the how much we understand about RNA and DNA, how much we understand about protein, like your work, the amount of proteins that you're exploring. Is it surprising to you that we were able, we descendants of apes, were able to figure all of this out. Like how, for, so you're a computer scientist. So for me, from computer science perspective, I I know how to write a Python program, things are clear, but biology is a giant mess. 
it feels like to me from an outsider's perspective is how surprising is it, amazing is it that we were able to figure this stuff out? You know, if you look at the, you know, how computational science and computer science was evolving, right? I think it was just a matter of time that we would approach biology. So so we, we started from, you know, applications to much more fundamental systems, physics, you know, and uh, now we are, or, you know, uh, small chemical compounds, right? So now we are approaching the more complex biological systems. And I think it's a natural evolution of, you know, of the computer science, of mathematics. So sure, that's the computer science side. I just meant even in, in higher levels. So that to me is surprising, that computer science can offer help in this messy world. But I just mean it's incredible that the biologists and the chemists can figure all this out. Or does that just sound ridiculous to you that, uh, that of course they would? It just seems like a very complicated set of problems. Like the the variety of the kinds of things that could be produced in the body. The just just like you said, twenty nine pro. I mean, just getting a hand of uh, a hang of it so quickly, it just seems impossible to me. I agree. I mean, it's and, and I have to say we are you know in the very very beginning of this journey. I mean, we we've yet to I mean we've yet to comprehend, not even try to understand and figure out all the details, but we've yet to comprehend the complexity of the cell. We know that neuroscience is not even at the beginning of understanding the human mind. So where's biology sit in terms of understanding the function, deeply understanding the function of viruses and cells? So there, sometimes it's easy to say when you talk about function, what you really refer to is, is perhaps not a deep understanding, but more of a understanding sufficient to be able to mess with it using a antivirus, like mess with it chemically to prevent some of its function. Or do you understand the function? Well, I think deeply. I think we are much farther in terms of understanding of the um, complex genetic disorders such as cancer where you have layers of complexity and we you know as a, in my uh, laboratory we're trying to contribute to that research but we're also you know we're overwhelmed with how many different layers of complexity different layers of mechanisms that can be hijacked by cancer simultaneously and so you know i think biology in the past 20 years Again, from the perspective of the outsider, because I'm not a biologist, <laughs> but I think uh, it has advanced tremendously. And one thing that uh, where uh, computational scientists and uh, data scientists are now becoming very, uh, very helpful is uh, in the fact, it's coming from the fact that we are now able to generate a lot of information about the cell, whether it's next generation sequencing or transcriptomics, whether it's live imaging information where it is, you know, uh, complex interactions between proteins or between proteins and small molecules such as drugs. We, we are, becoming very efficient in generating this information. And now the next step is to become equally efficient in processing this information and extracting the, the key knowledge from that. That could then be validated with experiment. Yes. Right back. yes. So, so maybe then going all the way back, we're talking, you said uh, the first step is seeing if we can match the new proteins you found in the virus against something we've seen before to figure out its function. And then you also mentioned that, but there could be cases where it's a totally new protein. Is there something bioinformatics can offer when it's a totally new protein? This is where 
many of the methods, and you probably are aware of, you know, the the case of machine learning. Many of these methods rely on the previous knowledge, right? Right. So uh, things that where we try to do from scratch are incredibly difficult. You know, something that we call ab initio. And this is, I mean, it's not just the function. I mean, you know, we have yet to have a robust method to predict the structures of these proteins in ab initio, you know, by not uh, using any templates uh, of other related proteins. So protein is a chain of uh, amino acids. It's residues. Res residues, yeah. Uh, and then, however, somehow magically, maybe you can tell me they they seem to fold in incredibly weird and complicated three D shapes. Yes. So, <laughs> uh, and that that's where actually the idea of protein folding, or just not the idea, but the problem of figuring out how the yeah, heck the they, concept the yeah. concept yeah how they fold into those sh weird shapes comes in. So that's another side of computational work. So what do you, can you describe what protein folding from the computational side is and maybe your thoughts on the folding at home efforts that yes. a lot of people know that you can use your machine to oh yeah to, to do protein folding. So yeah, pro protein folding is, you know, one of that those 1 million dollar price uh challenges, right? So uh, the reason for that is we've yet to understand precisely how the protein gets folded so efficiently to the point that in many cases where you you know where you try to unfold it due to the high temperature it actually folds back into its original state right so we 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 know a lot about the mechanisms right but put putting those mechanisms together and making since uh, it's a computationally very uh, expensive task. In general, do proteins fold, can they fold in arbitrary large number of ways or do they usually fold in a very small number of no, ways? It's, it's typically, I mean, we, we tend to think that, you know, there is a one sort of canonical fold for a protein, although the, there are many cases where the proteins, you know, upon destabilization, it can be folded into a different conformation. And this is especially true when you look at uh, sort of uh, proteins that in that include more than one structural unit. So those structural units we call them protein domains. And essentially, protein domain is a single unit that typically is evolutionary preserved, that typically carries out a single function, and typically has a very distinct uh, fold. Right, the structure, three D structure organization, but turns out that if you look at human, an average protein in a human cell would have two or a bit of two or three uh, such uh, subunits, and how they are trying to fold into the sort of you know uh, next level fold, right? Um, so within subunit, there's folding, and then. And then they fold into the uh, larger 3D structure, right? And and all of that, there's some understanding of the basic mechanisms, but not to put together to be able to fold yes. it. We're still, I mean, we're still struggling. I mean, we're, we're getting pretty good about folding relatively small proteins up to 100 uh, residues. With, I mean, but we're still far away uh, from folding, you know, larger proteins. And some of them are uh, notoriously difficult. Uh, for example, transmembrane proteins, proteins that, that sit in the, uh, in the membranes uh, of the cell, they're incredibly important, but they are incredibly difficult to solve. And so basically, there's a lot of degrees of freedom, how it folds. So it's a combinatorial problem where it just explodes. There's so many dimensions. It, well, it is a combinatorial problem, but it doesn't mean that we cannot approach it from the non kind of, not from the boot force approach. And so uh, the machine learning approaches, you know, have been uh, emerged that try to tackle it. So folding at home 
I don't know how familiar you are with it, but is that using machine learning or is it more brute force? No, so folding at home, it was originally, and I remember uh, I was a, I mean, it was a long time ago, I, w- I was a postdoc, uh, and we, we learned about this, uh, you know, this game, because it was originally designed as the, as game. As the game. And uh, we, uh, you know, I, I took a look at it, and it's interesting because it's, it's really, you know, it's very transparent, very intuitive. So, and from what I heard, uh, I've yet to introduce it to my son, but, you know, kids are actually getting very good at folding the proteins. And it was, you know, it it came to me as the, as the, not as a surprise, but actually uh, as the sort of manifest of, you know, our capacity uh, to to do this kind of, to solve this kind of problems, when um, a paper was published uh, published uh, in one of these top journals, with the co-authors being uh, the actual players of this wow. game. So, and what happened is uh, was that uh, they managed to get better structures than the scientists themselves. So, so that. You know, that was very, I mean, it was a kind of profound, uh, you know, revelation that problems that are so challenging for a computational science, uh, maybe not that challenging for a human brain. Well, that's a really good, um, that's a hopeful message always when there's a, a, the proof of existence uh, the existence proof that it's possible. That's really interesting. But the, it seems, what are the best ways to do protein folding now? So if you look at what DeepMind does with AlphaFold. AlphaFold, yes. So they kind of, is that's a learning approach. W- w- what's your sense? I mean, your background is in machine learning, but is, is this a learnable problem? Is this still a brute force? Are we in the uh, uh, Gary Kasparov, the blue days or are we in the alpha go playing the game of go days of, of folding well i think we are we are advancing uh towards this direction i mean if you look so there is a sort of olympic game for protein folders called casp <laughs> yes. and it's essentially it's you know uh it's a competition where uh different teams are given exactly the same uh protein sequences and they try to predict their structures, right? And of course, there are different uh, sort of uh, subtasks. But in the recent competition, AlphaFold was among the top performing teams, if not the top performing team. So uh, there is definitely a benefit from the data that have been generated, you know, in the past several decades, the structural data. And certainly, you know, we are now at the capacity to summarize this data, to generalize this data, and to use those principles, you know, in order to predict protein structures. That's one of the really cool things here is there's, uh, maybe you can comment on it. There seems to be these open data sets of protein. How did that, what that- A protein data bank? The pro, uh, yeah, protein data bank. Yes. I mean, that's crazy. Is this a recent thing for just the, the no. coronavirus, or is this no. been? A- it's it's been for many many years. I believe the first protein data bank was designed on flashcards. <laughs> so um, on the uh, so uh, yes, it's so th- this. I mean, this is a great example of the community efforts of everyone contributing, because every time you solve a protein or a pot- protein complex, this is where you submit it. And you know the scientists get access to it, scientists get to test it, and we bioinformaticians use this information to, you know, to make predictions. So there's no there's no culture of like hoarding uh, discoveries here. So it's 
good. I mean, you've you've uh, you've released a few uh, or a bunch of proteins that were matching. It's whatever. We'll, we'll talk about details a little bit, but it's kind of amazing uh, that that's the the. the it's kind of amazing how open the culture here is. It is. And I think this pandemic actually demonstrated the ability of scientific community to, you know, to solve this challenge collaboratively. And this is, I think it, if anything, it actually moved us to a brand new level of collaborations of the efficiency in which people establish new collaborations, in, in which people uh, offer their help to each other. Scientists offer their help to each other. And publish results too, it's very interesting. Exactly. We're now trying to figure out, there's a few journals that are trying to sort of do the very accelerated review cycle, but so many preprints, so just yes. posting a paper going yes. out, I think it's fundamentally changing the, the way we think about papers. Yes. I mean, the, the way we think about knowledge, knowledge I would say, knowledge. yes. Because yes, I completely agree. I think now it's, the knowledge be is becoming sort of the, the core value, not the paper or the journal where this knowledge is published. Yeah. And I think this is, again, this uh, we, we are living in the, in the times where it, becomes really crystallized that the the idea that the most important value is in the knowledge so maybe you can comment like what do you think the future of that knowledge sharing looks like so you have this paper that we'll i hope we we'll get a chance to talk about a little bit but it has like a really nice abstract and introduction related like it has all the usual i mean it probably took a long time to put together uh so <laughs> but is that going to remain like you could have communicated a lot of fundamental ideas here in much shorter amount that's less traditionally acceptable by the journal context. So, um, so well, you know, so the first version that we posted, not even on the BioArchive, because BioArchive uh, back then, it was essentially, uh, you know, overwhelmed with the number of submissions. So, so our submission, yeah, I think it took five or six days to just for it to be screened and and and, and put um, online. So we, you know, essentially we uh, put the first preprint on our website, and it, you know, it, it was it, it started getting accessed right away. Um, so and and you know, so so the, this original preprint was in a <laughs> much rougher shape than this paper um, and but we tried I mean we we honestly tried to be as compact as possible uh, with you know introducing the the information that is necessary that uh, to explain our you know our results so maybe you can dive right in if it's okay sure so it's a paper called structural genomics of SARS, -CoV how do you even pronounce? Uh, SARS CoV two, CoV two. Yeah. By the way, COVID is such a terrible name, but it's stuck. Anyway, yes. SARS CoV two indicates evolutionary con conserved functional regions of viral proteins. So this is looking at all kinds of proteins that are part of the this novel coronavirus and how they match up against the previous other kinds of coronaviruses. I mean, there's a lot of beautiful figures. I was wondering if you could, I mean, there's so many questions I could ask here, but uh, maybe at the, f how do you get started at doing this paper? So how do you start to figure out the 3D structure of a no no novel virus? Yes, so there is actually a, a, a little story behind it. And so the story actually dated back uh, in uh, September of 2019. And you probably remember that uh, back then we had another dangerous virus, triple E virus, is Eastern uh, equine encephalitis virus. And- uh, Can you maybe linger on it? I uh, have to admit, I was sadly completely unaware. So so that was actually uh, 
a virus outbreak that happened in New England only. The, the danger in this virus was that it actually it targeted your brain. So, uh, so there, there were deaths from this virus. Uh, it was, it was trans, uh, tr uh, you know, uh, transfer. The main vector was uh, mosquitoes, and obviously, fall time is you know the time where you have a lot of them in New England, and uh, you know, on one hand. People realized this is this is this is actually a very dangerous thing. So it had an impact uh, on the local economy. The schools were closed uh, past six o'clock. No activities outside for the kids because the kids were suffering uh, quite tremendously from you know when infected. Uh, from this virus, how do, how do I not know about this? Was uh, universities it was, impacted? It it was in the news. I mean, it was not impacted to to a high degree in in Boston necessarily, but in the Metro West area and actually spread around. I think uh, all the way to uh, New Hampshire, Connecticut. And you mentioned affecting the brain. That's one other comment we should make. So you you mentioned a. AC2 for the coronavirus. So these viruses kind of attach to something in the body. So it essentially attaches to the to these proteins uh, in those cells in the body where those proteins are expressed, where they actually have them in in abundance. So sometimes that could be in the lungs, that could be yes. in the brain, that could be. So in so I think what uh, they uh, right now uh, from what I read. They have uh, the epithelial cells inside. Yeah, so the the cells essentially inside the you know the it's the cells that are covering the surface, you know. So inside the uh, our na na nasal uh, surfaces, the the throat, um, the lung cells, and I believe liver as a couple of other organs where they are actually expressed in, a, in abundance. That's for the AC2, you said? For the AC2 okay. receptors. So, okay, so back to, back to the story. The so, outbreak yes. in the fall. So, uh, now, the, this, you know, the impact of this virus is significant. However, it's a pre-local problem to the point that you know, this is something that we would call a neglected disease because it's not big enough to make, you know, the uh, the drug design companies to design a new antiviral or a new vaccine. It's not big enough to generate a lot of uh, grants from the uh, na national funding agencies. So, so does it mean we cannot do anything about it? And so what I did is I taught um, a bioinformatics class uh -huh. and uh, in Worcester Polytechnic Institute. And we are very much uh, problem learning um, institution. So I thought that that would be a perfect, you know, perfect project it's kind for of the ongoing class. Ongoing case study. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I asked it, you know. So, so I uh, we essentially designed a study where we tried to use bioinformatics to to understand as much as possible about this virus. And a very substantial portion of the study was to understand the structures of the proteins, to understand how they interact with uh, with each other and with the uh, with the host proteins try to understand the evolution of this uh, virus. It's obviously, you know, a very important question, how, where it will evolve further, how, you know, how it happened here, you know. Um, so, so we did all these, you know, projects, and now I'm trying to put them in, in, into a paper where all these undergraduate students will be co-authors. Um, but, Essentially, the projects were finished right about mid-December. <laughs> and a couple of weeks later, I heard about this mysterious new virus, 
that was discovered in, you know, was reported in, in Wuhan province. And immediately I thought that, well, we just did that. Can't we do the same thing with this virus? And so we started waiting for the genome to be released because that's essentially the, the first piece of information that is critical. Once you have the genome sequence, you can start doing a lot using bioinformatics. When you say genome sequence, that's referring to the sequence of letters that make up the RNA? So, the, the, well, or, the, the, or the, the sequence the... that make up the entire information encoded in the protein, right? So, so that includes all 29 genes. What are genes? What's the encoding of information? So, so genes is essentially is a basic functional uh, unit that we can consider. So, so each gene in in the virus would uh, correspond to a protein. That so, gene by itself doesn't do its function. It needs to be converted or translated into the protein that will become the actual functional unit. Yeah, like you said, the, the printer. So, that, so we need the printer for that. We need the printer. Okay, so the, the first step is to uh, figure out the, the, the genome, the sequence of things that uh, yes. could be then used for printing the protein. So, okay. So then the, the, the next step, so, so once we have this, and uh, so we use the existing information about SARS, because uh, the SARS genomics, uh, has been done uh, in abundance. So we have different strains of, uh, of SARS and actually other related cor coronaviruses, MERS, uh, the bat uh, coronavirus. Um, and uh, we started by uh, identifying the potential genes because right now it's just a sequence, right? So it's a sequence that is roughly, um, it's less than 30,000 nucleotide uh, long and just uh, a raw sequence it's a raw sequence no other information exactly. really and uh we now need to define the boundaries of the genes that would then be uh used to identify the protein and protein structures how hard is that problem it's not i mean it's pretty straightforward so um you know, so because we use the existing information about uh, SARS proteins and pro SARS genes. Ah. So once again, you kind of... We are relying on the, yes. So, uh, and then once we get there, this is where sort of uh, the first more traditional bioinformatics steps uh, step begins. Uh, we're trying to use these protein sequences and... Uh, get the 3D information about those proteins. So this is where we are relying heavily on the structure information, specifically from the protein data bank that we are talking about. And here you're looking for similar proteins. Yes. So, so the, the concept that we are operating when we do this kind of modeling, it's called homology or template-based modeling. Uh, so essentially uh, using the concept that if you have two sequences that are similar in terms of the letters, mm -hmm. the structures of the sequences are expected to be similar as well. And this is at the micro, at the, at the very local scale and-, and at, at the scale of the whole protein. At the whole protein. Yeah. Right, so actually, so, you know, so uh, of course the devil is in the details and this is why we need actually uh, pretty sophisticated uh, modeling tools to do so. Um, once we get the structures of the individual proteins, uh, we uh, try to see whether or not these proteins act alone or they have to be forming protein complexes in order to perform this function. And again, so this is sort of the next level of the modeling because now you need to, uh, to understand how proteins interact. And it could be the case that the protein uh, interacts with itself 
and makes sort of a, a, a multimeric uh, complex. The same protein just repeated multiple times and uh, we have quite uh, quite a few such proteins uh, in uh, SARS-CoV-2, specifically uh, spike protein needs three copies to function. Uh, enveloped protein needs uh, five copies to function. And there are some other multimeric complexes. Well, that, that, that's what you mean by interacting with itself. There needs to be multiple copies. So how do you, uh, how do you make a good guess whether something's going to interact? Well, uh, again, else? so there are two approaches, right? So one is look at the previously solved complexes. Now we're looking not at the individual structures, but the structures of the whole complex. Um, uh, complex is a bunch, multiple proteins. Yeah, so, so it's a bunch of proteins essentially glued together. And, and when you say glued, that's the interaction. That's the interaction. So, so there are different and, forces, different uh, sort of physical forces behind this. And sorry, sorry to keep uh, asking dumb questions, but uh, is it, uh, is, the glue, is it uh, the interaction fundamentally structural or is it functional? Like in, in the way you're thinking about it. That's actually a very good way to ask this question because it turns out that the interaction is structural, but in the way it forms the structure, it actually also carries out the function. So interaction is often needed to carry out very specific function <laughs> or protein. But in terms of on the reverse side, figuring out you're really starting at the structure yes. before you figure out the function. Yes. So uh, there's a beautiful figure too in the paper of all the different proteins that make up, that you're able to figure out that make up um, the the new, the novel coronavirus. What, what are we looking at? Are, so these are like, that's the, through the, the step two that you mentioned, when you try to guess at the possible proteins, that's what you're going to get is these yeah. blue, blue cyan blobs. Yes, so, so those are the individual proteins for which we have at least some information from the previous studies, right? So there is advantage and disadvantage of using previous studies, the biggest, uh, well, the disadvantage is that, you know, we may not necessarily have the coverage of all 29 proteins. However, the biggest advantage is that the accuracy in which we can model these proteins is very high, much higher compared to ab initio methods that do not use any template information. So, but nevertheless, this figure also has, I mean, it's such a beautiful, and I love these pictures so much. Uh, you've uh, it has like the pink parts, yes. which are the parts that are different. So you're highlighting. Uh, so the difference you find is on the 2D sequence, and then you try to infer what that will look like on the 3D. Yeah. So so the difference actually is on 1D sequence. Right? 1D, 1D. Sorry, not right? 2D. Right. So and and so this is one of these first questions that we. Uh, try to answer is that, well, if you take this new virus and you take the closest relatives, which are SARS uh, uh, and a couple of bad coronavirus uh, strains, they are already the closest relatives that we are aware of. Now, what are the difference between this virus and its close relatives, right? And if you look, Typically, when you take a sequence, those differences could be quite far away from each other. So what make, uh, what 3D structure makes those difference to do, they very often they tend to cluster together. Interesting. And over sudden the differences that may look completely unrelated actually relate to each other and Sometimes they are there because they correspond, they, they attack the functional site, right? So they are there because this is the functional site that is highly mutated. So that's a computational 
approach to figuring something out. And when that when it comes together like that, that's kind of a nice clean indication that there's something this could be actually indicative of what's uh, what's happening. Yes, I mean, so so we we need this information, and you know, three uh, D the three D structure gives us just a a very intuitive way to look at this information, and then start to ask, you know, uh, start asking questions such as so this place of this protein that is highly mutated. Does it, does it, uh, is it the functional uh, part of the protein? So does this part of the protein interact with some other proteins or maybe with some other ligands, small small molecules, right? So we will try now to functionally inform this 3D structure. So, um... So you have a bunch of these mutated parts. You have like, I don't know, how, like uh, how many are there in the new novel coronavirus when you compare to SARS? We're talking about hundreds, thousands, like these these pink regions. No, no, the, the, much less than that. And it's very interesting that if you look at that, you know, so the first thing that you, you start seeing, right? You know, you look at patterns, right? And the first pattern that becomes obvious is that some of the proteins in the new coronavirus are pretty much intact, right? So they are pretty much exactly the same as SARS, as the uh, bad coronavirus, where some others are heavily mutated, mm -hmm. right? So, so it looks like that the, you know, the evolution is not, is not occurring you know, uniformly across the entire, you know, viral genome, but actually target very specific uh, proteins. And what do you do with that? Like from the Sherlock Holmes perspective? <laughs> well, you know, so one of the, uh, of the uh, most interesting findings we had was the fact that the viral, uh, so the, the binding sites, on the viral surfaces uh, that get targeted by the known small molecules, they were pretty much not affected at all. And so that means that the same small drugs or small, uh, small drug-like compounds can be efficient for the new coronavirus. Ah. Ah, uh, so this all actually maps to the drug compounds too. Like, so, so you, you're actually mapping out uh, what old stuff is going to work on this thing, exactly, and then possibilities for new stuff to work by mapping out the things that have mutated. Yes. So, so we essentially know which parts Amazing. behave differently and which parts are likely to behave similar. And again, you know, of course. All our predictions need to be validated by experiments, but hopefully that sort of helps us to delineate the regions of this virus that you know can be promising in terms of the drug discovery. You kind of you kind of mentioned this already, but maybe you can elaborate. So, how different from the structural and functional perspective does the new coronavirus appear to be relative to SARS? We now are trying to understand uh, the overall structural characteristics of this virus, because I mean, that's that's our next step, trying to model the viral particle of a uh, single viral particle of this virus. So that means, so you have the individual proteins, like you said, you have to figure out what their interaction is. Uh, so you have this. Is that where this graph kind of interactome? So so inter so so the, the interactome is, is essentially a so our prediction on the potential interactions. Some of them that we already deciphered from uh, the structural knowledge, but some of them that are essentially are deciphered from the knowledge of the existing interactions that people uh, 
previously obtained for SARS, for MERS, or other related um, uh, viruses. So is there kind of interactomes, am I pronouncing that correctly, yeah, by the way? Yeah, interactome. Yeah, uh, is, is, are those already converged towards for SARS, for? So there, I think there, 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 is, uh, there are a couple of papers that uh, now investigate the uh, sort of the large scale uh, set of uh, sets of interactions between uh, the new SARS and uh, its host, and so I think that's that's an ongoing study. I think, and the success of that, the result would be an interactome. Yes. And so, when you say not trying to figure out the entire the, the particle, so, so the, the entire the particle, thing, right? So, if you look, you know, so structure, right? So, what this viral particle looks like, right? So as I said, it's, it's you know, the surface of it is an envelope, which is essentially a, a so-called lipid bilayer uh, with proteins integrated into the surface. So how, so, so an average particle is around uh, 80 nanometers, right? So, this particle can uh, have about 50 to 100 spike proteins. So at, at least we suspect it, and you know, based on the micrographs images, it's very comparable to MHV virus in mice and SARS virus. Micrographs are actual pictures of the actual virus. Okay, so th these are models. This is actual. These are the, the, the actual images, right? What are they? Sorry for the tangents, but what do these things? Look, so uh, when you look on the internet, the models and the pictures are, and kind of, and the models you have here are just gorgeous and beautiful. Uh, when you actually take pictures of them with a micrograph, like what? What do we look? Well, they typically are not perfect, right? So, so the most of the images that you see now is the is a sphere with those spikes. You actually see around. the spikes? You actually... Yes, you do see the spikes. And uh, now, uh, you know, the our collaborators for Texas and uh, uh, University, um, uh, Benjamin Newman, uh, he actually, uh, in a recent paper about SARS, he proposed, and there's some actually evidence uh, behind it, that the particle is not a sphere, but is actually as an elongated ellipsoid like uh, particle. So, so that's what we are trying to incorporate into Just... our model. And the re I mean, you know, if you look at the actual micrographs, you see that those particles are, you know, are not symmetric. So the, the the some of them, and of course, you know, it could be due to the treatment of the of the material. It could be due to the um, some noise in the imaging. Right. So there's a lot of uncertainty yes. in all this. So it's okay. So structurally, figuring out the entire part. By the way, again, sorry for the tangents, but uh, why the term particle, or is it just something it's, that's it's, stuck? It's, a, it's a single, you know. So we call, you know we call it the virion. So virion particle, it's essentially a single virus. Single virus, but it just feels like, because particle to me, from the physics perspective, feels like this, the most basic unit, because uh, there seems to be so much going on inside the virus. Yeah. It doesn't feel like a particle to me. Yeah, so well, yeah, it's, it's probably, I think it's the, the, the you know, virion is, is a virion. good way. To call it so okay. So tr trying to figure out uh, trying to figure out the entirety of the system. Yes. So you know. So you know. So this is so the virion has fifty to hundred uh, spikes, but trimer spikes. It has roughly two hundred to four hundred um, membrane protein dimers. And those are arranged in the very nice lattice, so you can actually see sort of the it's it's like a uh, it's a carpet of you know, on the surface again exactly on the surface, and uh, occasionally you also see this envelope protein 
inside and some Is that the one we don't know what it does exactly exactly the one that that forms the pentamer this very nice pentameric ring and so you know so this is what we're trying to you know we're trying to put now all our knowledge together and see whether we can actually generate this overall virion model with an idea to understand you know well first of all to understand how uh how it looks like how far it is from those images nice. that were uh g generated but i mean the implications are you know uh there is a potential for the you know uh nanoparticle design that will mimic this uh, virion particle is the process of nanoparticle design meaning artificially designing something that looks similar? Yes, you know, so 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 the one that can potentially compete with the actual virion particles, and therefore reduce the effect of the infection. So is this the idea of like what is a vaccine? So vaccine, vaccine. So so that yeah. So there are two ways of essentially treating. And in the case of vaccine, is preventing the infection. So vaccine is, um, you know, a way to train our immune system. So our immune system becomes aware of this new danger, and therefore is capable of generating the antibodies. Then will essentially bind to. Uh, the spike proteins, because that's the main target for the anti, you know, for, for the vaccine's design, and um, block its functioning. If you have the spike with the antibody on top, it can no longer interact with AC2 receptor. Mm -hmm. So the the process of designing a vaccine then is you have to understand enough about the structure of the virus itself to be able to create an artificial uh, an artificial particle? Well, I mean, so, so, so the nan nanoparticle is, is a very exciting and new research. So there are already established ways to, you know, to make vaccines and there are several different ones, right? So, so there is one where uh, essentially the, the virus uh, gets through the cell culture multiple times, so it becomes essentially a com you know adjusted to the to, to the uh, specific embryonic cell, and as a result, become uh, becomes less uh, I, you know uh, compatible with the you know host human cells. So uh, and therefore, it's sort of the 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 idea of the uh, life vaccine where the the, the particles. Uh, are there, but they are not so efficient, you know, so they, they cannot replicate, you know, as rapidly as, you know, uh, before the vaccine. And th th they can be introduced to the immune system, the immune system will learn, and uh, the person who gets this vaccine won't, won't get, you know, uh, sick, or, you know, will have mild uh, you know, mild symptoms. So then there is sort of uh, different types of the way to introduce the non-functional uh, uh, non-functional parts of this virus uh, or the virus where some of the uh, information is stripped down. For example, the virus with no genetic uh, material. So, so we, with so no RNA genome, exactly. So it cannot replicate, it cannot essentially uh, perform most of the uh, it's functional. This is fascinating. But uh, what is the biggest hurdle to design one of these, to, to arrive at one of these? Is it the work that you're doing in the fundamental understanding of this new virus? Or is it in the, from my perspective, well, complicated world of experimental validation and sort of showing that this, like going through the whole process of showing this is actually gonna work with FDA approval, all that kind of stuff? I think it's both. I mean, you know, our understanding of the molecular mechanisms will allow us to, you know, to design, to have more efficient designs of the vaccines. Um, however, the once you design a vaccine, it it needs to be tested. 
But when you look at the 18 months and the different projections, it seems like an exceptionally, from historically speaking, maybe you can correct me, but this, even 18 months seems like a very accelerated timeline. It is, it is. I mean, I remember reading uh, about the, you know, in a book about some previous uh, vaccines that it could take up to 10 years to design and, you know, properly yeah. uh, test a vaccine before it's mass production. So yeah, we, we you know, everything is accelerated these days. <laughs> I mean, for better, for worse, but, but you know, we, we definitely need that. Well, especially with the coronavirus, I mean, the scientific community is really stepping up and working together. The collaborative aspect is really interesting. Uh, you mentioned, uh, so vaccine is one, and then there's antiviral, Antivirals. antiviral drugs. So antiviral drugs, so where, you know, vaccines are, typically needed to prevent the infection, right? But once you have an infection, one, one you know, so what we uh, try to do, we try to stop it. So we try to stop uh, virus from functioning. And so the, the antiviral drugs are designed to block some critical functioning of the, uh, of the proteins uh, from the viral, uh, from the virus. So uh, there are, a number of interesting candidates. And I think, uh, you know, if you ask me, uh, I, you know, I think Remdesivir is perhaps the most promising. Uh, it's, it has been shown to be, uh, you know, uh, an, an efficient and effective antiviral uh, for uh, SARS. Uh, Originally, it was the uh, the antiviral drug uh, developed for a completely different uh, virus. I think for Ebola and Bar Marburg. At high virus. levels, do you know how it works? Um, so it tries to mimic um, one of the nucleotides in RNA, and essentially that uh, that stops the replication from. So messes. I, mean, I guess that's what. It so any viral drugs mess with some aspect of this yes. process. So, so you know, so essentially we try to f to stop certain functions of the virus. There are some other ones, uh, you know, uh, that are designed to inhibit the protease, the the thing that clips uh, protein sequences. Uh, there is one that was originally designed for uh, malaria. Which is a bacterial, you know, uh, bacterial disease. So um, this is so cool. So, but that's exactly where your work steps in is you're figuring out the functional, the and the, the structure of these different. So, like uh, providing candidates for where drugs can plug in. Exactly. Well, yes, uh, because you know, one thing that we don't know is whether or not. So, let's say we have a perfect drug candidate that is efficient against SARS and against MERS. Now, is it gonna be efficient against uh, new SARS-CoV-2? We don't know that, and there are multiple uh, aspects that can affect this efficiency. So, uh, for instance, if the, uh, the binding site, so the, 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 the part of the protein where this ligand gets attached, if this site is mutated, then the ligand may not be attachable to this part any longer. And, uh, you know, our work and the work of other uh, bioinformatics groups, you know, essentially are uh, trying to understand whether or not that will be the case. Uh, or, uh, and it looks like for, for the ligands that we uh, looked at, um, the ligand binding sites are pretty much intact is very promising. So if we can just like zoom out for a second, what, are you optimistic? So there's two, well, there's three possible ends to the coronavirus pandemic. So one is there's, or drugs or vaccines get figured out very quickly, probably drugs first. The other is the, the, the pandemic runs its course. Uh, for this wave, at least. And then the the third is, you know, things go much worse. 
in some in some dark, bad, very bad direction. Do do you see? Let's focus on the first two. <laughs> do you see uh, the anti drugs or the work you're doing being relevant for us right now in uh, stopping the pandemic, or do you hope that the pandemic will run its course? So the social distancing things like uh, wearing masks, all those discussions that people are having will be the the method with which we fight coronavirus in the short term? Or do you think that it'll have to be antiviral drugs? I think, uh, I think antivirals would be, uh, I would view that as the, at least the short term solution. I see more and more, uh, cases in the news of uh, those new drug candidates being administered in hospitals. And I mean, this is right now the best what we have. But do we need it I, in order do, to reopen we, the economy? I what mean, we, we, we definitely need it. I, I cannot sort of speculate on how that will affect reopening of the economy because we are you know we are kind of deep in into the pandemic and it's not just the the states it's also you know worldwide um you know um of course you know there is also the possibility of the second wave as we you know uh, as you mentioned and uh, this is why you know we need to be super careful. We need to follow all the uh, precautions that the doctors tell us to do. Are you worried about the mutation of the virus? So f- it's of course a, a real possibility. Now, how, to what extent this virus can mutate, it's an open question. I mean, we know that it is able to mutate, to jump from one species to another and to to become transmittable between humans, right? So will it, you know, so let's imagine that we have the new antiviral. Uh, will this virus become eventually resistant to this antiviral? We don't know. I mean, this is what needs to be studied so it's such a beautiful and terrifying process that a virus, some viruses, may be able to mutate to respond to the, to mutate around the thing we've put before it. Can you explain that process? Like, how does that happen? Is just is that just the way of evolution? I w- I would say so. Yes. I mean, it's it's the evolutionary mechanisms. There is nothing imprinted into this virus that makes it you know it it just the way it it evolves and it actually it's the way it co-evolves with its host right? it's just amazing it's especially the evolution mechanism is especially amazing given how simple the virus yes. is it's incredible that it's uh, i mean it's, it's beautiful it's beautiful because it's the, the one of the cleanest examples of evolution working well i think i mean the one of the uh, sort of the reason for its simplicity is because it does not require all the necessary functions to be stored right so it actually can hijack the the majority of the necessary functions from the host cell right? so 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 the ability to do so, in my view, reduces the complexity of this uh, machine drastically. Although, if you look at the you know most recent discoveries, right? So the scientists discovered viruses that are as large as bacteria, right? So this mimi viruses and mama viruses. It actually those discoveries made scientists to reconsider the origins of the virus, you know, and what are the mechanisms and how, you know, uh, 
what are the mechanisms, the evolutionary mechanisms that leads to the appearance of the viruses. By the way, I mean, you did mention that viruses aren't, I think you mentioned that they're not living. Yes, they're not living organisms. But let me ask that question again. Uh, why do you think they're not living organisms? Well, because they, they are dependent. Uh, the majority of the functions of the virus are dependent on the, on the host. So let me so, do the devil's advocate. Let me be the philosophical uh, devil's advocate here and say, well, humans, which we would say are living, need our host planet to survive. So you can basically take every living organism that we think of as definitively living, it's always going to have some aspects of, it, of its host that it needs, of its environment. So is that really the key aspect of why a virus is that dependence? Because it seems to be very good at uh, doing so many things that we consider to be intelligent. It's just that dependence part. Well, I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's you know, difficult to answer in this way. I mean, I, I, the way I think about the virus is, you know, in order for it to function, it needs to have the critical component the critical tools that it doesn't have. So, I mean, that's, that's, you know, in my way, you know, the, the, it's not autonomous, right? And, and that, that's how I separate the, the idea of the living organism on a very high level. Yes. Uh, between the living organism and, and, and you have some, no, we have, I mean, these are just terms and it, perhaps they don't mean much, but we have some kind of sense of what autonomous means and that humans are autonomous. You've also done excellent work in the epidemiological modeling, the simulation of these things. So the zooming out outside of the body, yeah. doing the agent-based simulation. So. That's where you actually simulate individual human beings and then the spread of viruses from one to the other. Uh, how does, at a high level, agent-based simulation work? All right, so it's it's also <laughs> one of this ir uh, irony of timing. Because, I mean, we, we, we've worked on this uh, project for the past five years. And uh, the New Year's Eve, I got an email from my PG student that you know the last experiments were co completed, and you know uh, three weeks after that we get we get this diamond princess story, <laughs> and <laughs> emailing each other with the same you know <laughs> the same news saying like <laughs> so uh, the diamond princess is a cruise ship yes and uh, what was the project that you work on so so the project years? I mean it's. Uh, you know, the code name, it started with a bunch of undergraduates. Uh, the code name was uh, Zombies on a Cruise Ship. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they wanted to essentially model the, the you know, zombie apocalypse, uh, apocalypses on a cruise ship. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, after having, you know, some fun, we then thought about the fact that, you know, uh, if you look at the cruise ships, I mean, the infectious outbreak is, has been, one of the biggest threat, uh, you know, threats to the uh, cruise ship economy. So perhaps the most, uh, you know, frequently occurring virus is the Norwalk virus, um, and this is essentially one of these stomach flus that you have, and you know, it it can be quite devastating. You know, so there are occasionally there are cruise ships get you know they, they 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 get canceled they get returned to the back to the uh, to the origin and uh, so we wanted to study and this is very different from the traditional epidemiological studies where the scale is much larger so we wanted to study this in a confined 
environment, which is a cruise ship, it could be a school, it could be other, you know, uh, other places such as, you know, the this large, uh, large company where people are in interaction. And uh, the benefit of this model is we can actually track that in the real time. So we can actually see the whole course of the evolution, uh, uh, the, the whole course of the interaction between the uh, infected pass, uh, the infected uh, host and you know the host and the pathogen, etc. So so agent based uh, system or multi agent system, to be uh, precisely. Um, is a good way to approach this um, problem because we can uh, introduce the behavior of the uh, of the passengers of the crews, and uh, what we did for the first time. That's where you know uh, we introduce some novelty. Is we introduce uh, a pathogen agent explicitly. So. That allowed us to essentially model the behavior on the host side as well on the pathogen side, and over sudden we can uh, we can have a flexible model that uh, allows us to integrate all the key parameters about the infections. So, for example, uh, the virus, right? So the ways of of transmitting the virus between the uh, the host uh, how long does virus survive on the surface the fomite um, what is you know how uh, much of the viral particles does a host shed when he or she is asymptomatic versus symptomatic. And you can encode all of that into this path. And yes. it's just for people who don't know, so agent-based simulation, usually the agent represents a single human being. And then there's some graphs, like contact graphs that represent the interaction between those human beings. So yes, so we, uh, so essentially, you know, so, so agents are, you know, individual programs that are, uh, run in parallel and we we can uh, provide instru instructions for these agents how to interact with each other how to exchange information in this case exchange the the infection but in this case in your case you've added a pathogen as an agent i mean that's yes. kind of fascinating it's a uh, as it's kind of a brilliant simple like a brilliant way to condense the parameters to to uh, aggregate to bring the parameters together that represent the the pathogen the virus yes that's fascinating actually so yeah it it was a you know uh, we realized that you know by bringing in the the virus we can actually start modeling i mean we we are not no longer bounded by very specific sort of aspects of uh the specific virus so we end up uh we, we started with you know uh norwalk virus and of course zombies but we uh continued to uh modeling ebola virus outbreak uh flu sars uh and uh because i felt that we need to add a little bit more sort of uh excitement for uh uh, our undergraduate students. <laughs> so we um, actually uh, modeled the virus from the Contagion movie. Yes. So MEV1. And, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately that virus, and we, we tried to extract as much information. Luckily, the this movie was, uh, the scientific consultant um, was Jan Lipkin, uh, a virologist from uh, Columbia University who is actually, who provided, I think he designed this virus for this movie based on Nipah virus. And I think with some uh, ideas behind SARS or flu, like airborne viruses. And um, 
you know the it the movie surprisingly contained uh, enough details for us to extract and to model it. I was hoping he would like publish a paper of how this virus works. Yeah, we we, we are planning to publish. I would it. love it if you did, yes. but it would be nice if the you know if the um, the ho the origin of the virus. Uh, but you're now actually being a scientist and studying the virus from that perspective. But the origin of the virus, you 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 know, I, you know, the first time I actually. So this movie is assignment number one in my bioinformatics <laughs> class that I uh, that, that I give yeah. because it uh, it also tell it tells you that you know bioinformatics can be of use because if uh, if I don't know you watched it have you watched it a long time ago yeah so so there is you know approximately a week from the you know virus detection we see a screenshot of a scientist looking at the structure of the surface protein uh -huh. and this is where i tell my students that you know if you ask a experimental biologist uh, they would tell you that it's impossible because it takes months maybe years to get the crystal structure of this you know the, the structure that is represented if you ask a bioinformatician they tell you sure why not you know <laughs> we'll just get it modeled yeah and and yes yeah, so, so so but but it, it was very interesting to to see that there is actually you know uh, uh and if you do it uh, uh, do screenshots you actually see the phylogenetic tree the evolutionary tree that relate this virus with other viruses so it was a lot of scientific thought put into the movie and one thing that uh, I was actually, you know, it was interesting to, to learn is that the origin of this virus was a, there were two uh, animals that led to the, you know, the 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 you know the zoonotic ver uh, origin of this virus were fruit bat and a, a pig. <laughs> So you know, so 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 this this is this is, this, is, this doesn't is. feel like we're this this definitely feels like we're living in a simulation, okay. Uh, but maybe a big picture, aging based simulation now larger scale, sort of not focused on a cruise ship, but larger scale are used now to drive some policy. So politicians use them to tell stories and narratives and try to figure out how. How to move forward under so much, so much uncertainty. But in your sense, are agent-based simulation useful for actually predicting the future, I or think, are they useful mostly for comparing relative comparison of different intervention methods? Well, I think uh, both, because you know, in the case of uh, new coronavirus, we we essentially learning that the uh, current intervention methods may not be efficient enough. One thing that one uh, important aspect that I find to be so critical and yet something that was overlooked you know, during the past pandemics is the effect of the asymptomatic period. This virus is different because it has such a long symptomatic uh, period, and over sudden, that creates a completely new game when trying to contain this virus. In terms of the dynamics of the infection, exactly. Uh, do you also? I don't know how closely you're tracking this, but uh, do you also think that there's a different? like uh, rate of infection for when you're asymptomatic like that that aspect or is, does a virus not care so uh, th uh there were a couple of works um so one important parameter that tells us how uh, contagious the the person with asymptomatic virus versus asymptomatic is uh looking at the number of viral particles this person sheds, you know, um, as a function of time. Um, so, so far, what I saw is uh, the study that uh, tells us that the, you know, 
the person during the asymptomatic uh, period is already contagious and it sheds, uh, the person sheds a, enough viruses to infect yeah, and another I, host. And I think there's so many excellent papers coming out, but I, I think I just saw some, maybe a nature paper that said the first week is when you're symptomatic or asymptomatic, you're the most contagious. So the highest level of, uh, of the like the, the plot sort of in the 14 day period, they collected a, a bunch of subjects. And I think the first week is when it's the most intense. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I, I'm Just waiting, crazy. I'm waiting to see sort of more, uh, uh, more populated studies, right? right. This, uh, with higher numbers. Um, my, uh, one of my favorite studies was uh, again a very recent one where uh, scientists determined that um, tears are not contagious. <laughs> so, so there is, you know, so there is no viral shedding done through through tears. So they found one lick, moist thing that's not contagious, and I mean, there's a lot of I'm. I've, personally been, because I'm on a survey paper uh, somehow that's looking at masks. And there's been so much interesting debates on the efficacy of masks, and there's a lot of work, and there's a lot of interesting work on uh, whether this virus is airborne. I mean, it's a totally open question. There's, it's leaning one way right now, but it's a totally open question whether it can travel in aerosols long distances. I mean, do you have a, do you think about the stuff? Do you track the stuff? Are you focused on the, yeah, the I mean, bioinformatics you know, of it? I mean, the, 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 this is uh, this is a very important aspect for our epidemiology study. Um, I think the, I mean, and it's sort of a, a very simple uh, sort of idea, but uh, I agree with people who say that uh, the mask, the masks work in both the, uh, in both ways so it not only it protects you from the you know incoming viral yeah. particles it also you know it it you know makes the potentially uh, contagious person not to spread the viral particles who is when they're asymptomatic may not even exactly. know that they're exactly in fact there, it seems to be there's evidence that they don't uh surgical and certainly homemade masks, which is what's needed now actually, because there's a huge shortage of, they don't work as to protect you that well. They work much better to protect others. So it's uh, so it's, it's a motivation for us to um, all wear one. Yeah, Just exactly. Cause I mean, you know, very... you don't know where, you know, and so, you know, about 30%, as far as I remember, at least 30% of the asymptomatic cases are completely asymptomatic yeah right so you don't really cough you don't uh i mean you don't have any symptoms yet you shed viruses do you think it's possible that we'll all wear masks so i, I wore a mask at the grocery store and you just you get looks i mean this was like a week ago maybe it's already changed because uh i think cdc or somebody's i think the cdc has said that we should be wearing masks like the la they're starting to happen but do you it just seems like something that this country will really struggle doing or no i hope not i mean you know it it was interesting i was looking through the uh through the old pictures during the spanish flu mm -hmm. and you could see that the you know pretty much everyone was wearing masks with some exceptions and there were like you know uh, sort of iconic uh, photograph of the i think it was san francisco this uh, tram who was refusing to let in a uh, you know s someone without the mask so i think well you know it's also you know it's related to the fact how, or, you know how much we are scared right so how much do we treat this problem seriously? And, you know, my take on it is we should, because it is very serious. 
Yeah, I, 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 from a psychology perspective, just worry about the entirety, the entire big mess the, of a psychology experiment that this is, whether masks will help it or hurt it. You know, masks have a way of distancing us from others by removing the emotional expression and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, masks also signal that uh, I care about your well being. Exactly. So it's a really interesting uh, yeah. trade off. That's just a. Uh, yeah, it's it's interesting, right? About distancing. Uh, aren't we distanced enough? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> I, uh, and when we try to come closer together when they do reopen the economy, um, that's going to be a, a long road of rebuilding trust and not, not all being huge germaphobes. Yes. Let me ask sort of. Um, you have a bit of a Russian accent, Russian or no Russian accent? Russian. Russian. So, uh, were you born in Russia? Yes, and yeah, you, you're too kind. I have a pretty thick Russian accent. <laughs> um, what are your favorite memories of Russia? So I, um, so I moved first to Canada and then to the uh, to the United States uh, back in 99. So by that time I was 22. So, uh, you know, whatever ra uh, Russian accent I, I, I got back then, you know, it stuck with <laughs> me uh, for the rest of my life. Uh, you know, it's, yeah. So I, you know, uh, by the time the Soviet Union collapsed, I was, you know, I was a kid but sort of you know old enough to to realize that there are changes and uh did you want to be a scientist back then oh what? yes oh yeah i mean my first uh the first sort of uh 10 years of my sort of uh you know uh, juvenile life i wanted to be a pilot of a passenger jet plane. Wow. So yes, it, it was like, you know, uh, and I was getting ready, uh, you know, to, to go to a college to get the degree. But I've been always uh, fascinated by science and, you know, so uh, not just by math, uh, of course, math was one of my favorite subjects, but, you know, bi biology, chemistry, physics, somehow I, I, you know, I liked those four subjects together, and um, yes, yeah, so, so so essentially, after a certain period of time, I wanted to actually uh, back then it it was a very popular uh, um, sort of uh, area of science called cybernetics. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of it's not really computer science, but it's it was like you know computational robotics yes in this sense and so i really wanted to to do that and but then you know i uh you know i realized that you know uh my biggest passion was in mathematics and uh later i uh, you know when uh you know studying in uh, moscow state university i also realized that i really want uh to apply the the knowledge, so I really wanted to to mix, you know, uh, the mathematical knowledge that I get with real life problems. And that could be you mentioned chemistry, and then the, uh, now biology. On a sort of, um, does it make you sad? Maybe I'm wrong on this, but it seems like it's difficult to be in collaboration to do open big science in Russia. From my distant perspective in computer science, I don't, I'm not, I, we can go to conferences in Russia. I sadly don't have many collaborators in Russia. I don't know many people doing great AI work in Russia. Uh, does it make, does that make you sad? Am I wrong in seeing it this way? Well, I mean, I am, I have to tell you, I'm I'm privileged to uh, to have collaborators in bioinformatics in Russia, and I think this is the the bioinformatics school in Russia is very strong, 
we have in Moscow, uh, in Moscow, in Novosibirsk, uh, in Saint Petersburg, uh, have great collaborators in uh, Kazan. And uh, so, at least uh, you know, in terms of um, you know, uh, my area of research, there's strong we, people there. Yeah, strong people, a lot of great ideas, very open to collaborations. So I, 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 I perhaps you know, it's my luck, but uh, you know, I haven't experienced uh, you know. Uh, any difficulties in establishing collaborations? But that's so, bioinformatics, though. It could be bioinformatics too, and it could, be, uh, yeah, it, it's it could be person by person related. But I just don't feel the warmth and love that I would. You know, you, you talk about the the seminal people who are French in artificial intelligence. France w welcomes them with open arms. In so many ways, I, I just don't feel the love from Russia. I I do on the human beings like people in general like friends and and just cool interesting people but from the scientific community no conferences no big conferences and it's uh yeah it's actually you know i i'm, I'm trying to think yeah I, I cannot recall any any big ai conferences in russia it has an effect on uh for me i haven't sadly been back to russia so you i should. can't but my problem is it's very difficult. So I'm now I have to re renounce the citizenship. Oh, is that right? I mean, I'm a citizen in the United States and it makes it very difficult. There's a mess now, right? So yeah. I want to be able to travel like, you know, legitimately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, it's, it's, not, it's not an obvious process. They don't make it super easy. I mean, that's part of that. Like, you know, it should be super easy for me to travel there. Well, you know, uh, hopefully, this unfortunate circumstances that we are in will actually promote the the remote collaborations. Yes, and I think we we've just, I think what we are experiencing right now is that you still can do science. You know, being quarantined in your yeah. own homes. Yeah. Especially when it comes, I mean, you know, I, I certainly understand there is a very challenging time for experimental sciences. I mean, I have many collaborators who are, you know, who are affected by that. But for computational sciences. Yeah, we're really leaning into the remote communication. Nevertheless, I had to force you to talk to you in person because there's something that you just can't do in terms of conversation like this. I don't know why, but in person, is very much needed, so I really appreciate you doing it. Uh, you have a collection of science bobbleheads. Yes. <laughs> which look amazing. Which uh, which bobblehead is your favorite, and uh, which real world version, which scientist is your favorite? That... Yeah. So yeah, uh, by the way, I was trying to bring it in, but they are quarantined now <laughs> in, my, in my office. They sort of demonstrate the social distance, so they're <laughs> nicely spaced uh, away from each other. But um, so you know, it's interesting. So I've been I've been collecting those bubble heads uh, for the past maybe twelve or thirteen years, and it you know, interestingly enough, it started with the two bubble heads of Watson and Creek, mm -hmm. and. Um, Interestingly enough, my last bubble head in this collection for now, and my favorite one, because I, I felt so good when I got it, was the Rosalind Franklin. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so you know, when I who got is the, it, Who's the full so, group? So I have Watson, Crick, Newton, Einstein, Marie Curie, Tesla, uh, of course, Charles Darwin, sorry, Charles Darwin, right. um, and Rosalind Franklin. I am definitely missing quite a few of my uh, favorite scientists. And, but uh, so, uh, you know, if I were to add to this collection, so I would add, of course, Kolmogorov. <laughs> Interesting. That's, 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 you know, I've been always fascinated by his well, his dedication to science, but also his dedication 
to uh, educating young people, the next generation. So it's 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 very inspiring. He's one of the Ru okay, yeah. He's one of the Russia's greats. Yes. He, yeah. So he also, um, you know, uh, the school, the high school that I attended, was named after him, and he was a great. You know, so he founded the school, uh, school um, and he actually taught there. Is this in Moscow? Yes. So, uh, but then, I mean, um, you know, other people that I would definitely like to see in my collections uh, was, uh, would be um, Alan Turing, would be John von Neumann. Yeah, you're, you're a little bit later than the computer scientists. Yes. He, well, I mean, they he, don't. They don't make them. They you know, I, I, I still am amazed. Uh, they, they haven't made Alan Turing. Yeah. Yet. Yes. And and uh, and I would also add the uh, Linus Pauling. Uh, Linus Pauling. So, Who is Linus Pauling? So this is this is uh, to me is one of the greatest chemists. Uh, and the person who actually discovered the uh, secondary structure of proteins, who was very close to solving the DNA structure. And um, you know, people argue, but uh, some of them were pretty sure uh, that if not for this, you know, uh, uh, photograph 51 by Rosalind Franklin that, you know, uh, Watson and Creek got access to. Um, he would be, he, he would be the one who would solve it. Uh, science is a funny race. It is. Let me ask the the biggest and the most ridiculous question. So you've kind of studied the human body and um, its defenses and these enemies that are about. Uh, from a biological perspective, bioinformatics perspective, a computer scientist perspective, how has that made you see your own life? Sort of uh, the meaning of it, or just even seeing your, what it means to be human? Well, it certainly makes me realizing how fragile the human life is. If you think about this little tiny thing, can impact the life of the whole human kind to such extent. So, you know, it's it's something to appreciate and to you know to remember that that you know we are fragile. We have to bond together as a society and you know it also gives me um, sort of hope that what we do as scientists uh, is useful <laughs> well i don't think there's a better way to end it Dmitri. thank you so much for talking today it was an honor appreciate thank it you very much thanks for listening to this conversation with Dmitri korkin and thank you to our presenting sponsor cash app Please consider supporting the podcast by downloading Cash App and using code LEXPODCAST. If you enjoy this podcast, subscribe on YouTube, review it with five stars on Apple Podcasts, support it on Patreon, or simply connect with me on Twitter at Lex Friedman. And now, let me leave you with some words from Edward Osborne Wilson, E.O. Wilson. The variety of genes on the planet and viruses exceeds or is likely to exceed that in all of the rest of life combined. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time.